Our next presenters are two gentlemen who are both esteemed lawyers here in the city of Chicago. Damon Sharonis has been a practicing attorney in the criminal defense area, handling many large cases, and is seen as one of the city's leading criminal defense attorneys. And Kevin Churn has run the country's largest bankruptcy law firm. He is also the president of Total Attorneys. And today, both of them are going to come up here and talk a little bit about how to actually sign up clients once they come to your door. So with that, I turn it over to Damon and Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, looks like uh, we've got some people who have had a long night. <laughs> How's everyone feeling this morning? You do some fun stuff last night, get a, a little work-life balance? Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, what I'm going to be referencing is going to you know, be applicable to, I'm going to be talking specifically about talking to bankruptcy clients, although there are a lot of attorneys here who are not bankruptcy attorneys. And, uh, so I'm sure you're going to be able to garner a lot of value out of just some of the general concepts I'm going to talk about. But Damon's here, obviously, to give a little bit different perspective because he's uh, a, a criminal attorney. So it's kind of moral bankruptcy that I deal with as opposed to <laughs> bankruptcy law, I guess, would be, a, would be a way of explaining it. He's talking about the clients, not himself. Well, of course. Let's make that <laughs> distinction right off the bat. Uh, so, you know, just to, to preface it a little bit, you know, people were talking about, well, first day was pretty heavily focused on marketing and how to draw clients into your practice through a website or through a blog or whatever. And, you know, some people uh, say you don't need a website. Some people say you need a blog. And everybody has their own opinion. I'm not going to speak to, you know, which one is the right one for your particular practice. Um, you know, Damon's got a website. And, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, tell me, like, what, were you, what was your thinking about when you got a website? What, what were you trying to accomplish through it for your own particular website? Uh, for your own particular practice. When I first uh, started advertising on the web, I did it basically two ways. Uh, the initial way was actually through total attorneys where they generate leads and people call you. But then I just realized that everyone has a website. And I've had people, clients, ask me, well, I looked you up on the web and I couldn't find you or, or I didn't you know, know how to contact you. So getting a website for me was just a, a, a dual purpose. One, if people want to find you, it's an easier way to do it. And also, I kind of use it as a scoreboard to some extent. I mean, I will put up cases that I've won, or I, I won't include the ones that I've lost, but I'll, I'll put the cases that I've won up there and let the, the consumer, the client, know a little bit about me. So when they come into a meeting, they're more informed, uh, and they have kind of a, a background for what I do, kind of cases I've handled. Right. So you know, the question is, well, what does marketing have to do with having work-life balance? Uh, and in my mind, first of all, if uh, there are no work-life balance issues if you don't have any uh, clients <laughs> to hire you. There's no practice, no, no need for practice management if you don't have clients. Your, your website or your marketing is an extension of you, and to the extent that you do a good job at marketing yourself, it also brings a certain sense of pride and satisfaction in what you're doing. I guess one of the questions you should ask yourself is when you look at your marketing and you look at your website, do you feel a sense of pride in the way that you're conveying your uh, you know, your reputation to the rest of the community. And so I think it is very relevant when you talk about marketing within the context of work-life balance, how you paint yourself to the public also has an impact on how you feel about yourself, how your employees feel about your practice uh, and, and your reputation in general. Once you go ahead and get those clients to come through your door the, or to actually call you, this session is about what you do to establish the relationship. And we call it the art of closing uh, where marketing client relations intersect, but the art of closing is a little bit of a misnomer. It sounds like you're, you know, you're selling something. You are selling your own services, but it's really about establishing a relationship with the client. And by establishing a relationship with the client, you are improving your level of satisfaction of what you're doing every day of your life. Uh, and we're going to go through a number of ways that you can establish that relationship with the client and actually feel really good about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. One thing that I do want to point out to you is that as, as attorneys, especially serving consumers, you, each one of you has a unique opportunity every single day to put your life in perspective. Almost without exception, you are more fortunate than almost every single person that you talk to on a day-to-day -day basis, and you should each take advantage of that to feel good about your life and feel happy about what you're doing. You're actually helping people, and many of you bankruptcy attorneys or other attorneys that you know, you know, file bankruptcy petition, 
where uh, you're getting an automatic scan effect right away, you have the ability to make the most significant and immediate impact on someone's life out of pretty much any lawyer within the legal industry. You can change a person's life overnight. I don't know if you can speak to that. Well, well. yeah, I can uh, speak to a few things that Kevin said. Initially, uh, you know, when we're in law school, there's no class that says, you know, this is how you get clients, this is how you get business. And when you leave law school uh, and, you, and you go out on your own, if you do that, uh, you realize it's a very competitive market out there. And uh, the majority of lawyers that I talk to who complain about business, especially in an economy such as this, you know, I ask them, well, what do you do to try to get clients, you know? Uh, in my profession, I get lawyer referrals. You know, not everybody does criminal defense. So if somebody gets in trouble, they'll call me. Uh, and I do web marketing. I, I do uh, some advertising in local papers. But the lawyers who say that they don't do advertising, they don't have a website, they're not involved in a group like this, you know, respectfully, no wonder no one knows who you are or can't get to you. It's being accessible to your clients and letting them know that you're out there is very important because that allows you to get that business. You know, people will call you if they can get to you. And I think that's part of what Kevin's talking about. Right. So we've got our six rules. Uh, and you know, this is in your, if you uh, turn to page 15 of your workbook, you can kind of follow, follow along what we're talking about. Uh, first of all, ask questions. So we, we, you know, this is going back to, uh, to law school, the Socratic method. So as an attorney, really, you're not there to tell a a client what they need. You're, to, you're there to ask them questions in order to identify exactly what is motivating you to contact them, uh, them to contact you in the first place. So a consumer calls up and starts uh, talking about what's going on in their situation. What you need to be doing is listening. You don't need to be playing law professor. So, you know, a consumer says, I'm getting har harassed by all those telephone calls and, uh, from, from the creditors. The inclination is to start pl playing law professor and saying, well, we can get an automatic stay and put that in effect and we can immediately stop the calls. And there's an injunction issued by the court that prohibits them from doing, and you've, you're essentially talking over the, the debtor's head. I mean, you're talking about someone who probably has a seventh to eighth grade education and you're completely over their head. What you should be doing is asking them questions about what is motivating them to call. What, what is it that is creating this urgency? Why are you picking up the phone and taking a huge step? Remember, it was a huge step to, just to dial that number in the first place. Remember, bankruptcy is not something that people, a decision that people take lightly. The fact that they picked up the phone and called you means they've taken a huge leap of faith. They've said, I'm ready to do something in my life, and your job is to find out exactly what it is that is motivating them to pick up the call, because that's the first step to setting up that relationship. And a lot of the calls I get start out with, uh, you have a collect call from the county jail. Uh, do you accept the charges? So they really usually only have one call when they call me to some extent. Um, but a lot of times family members come in. It's not just people who are arrested. You know, I'll have family members coming in. And these people want to know why you should represent their spouse, their loved one. And it's different to some extent with bankruptcy, but at the same point, you have to right away establish why it is you're the one they should hire because there's a lot of lawyers out there. I mean, you guys compete amongst each other in this room to some extent. And once they call you and you can get them in your office, the most important thing, I think, is to exude confidence to those people and let them know that you're the right person for the job. Um, and, yeah, and in the process of asking questions of the person and really identifying exactly what their motivations are give you the opportunity to do so many different things uh, with them. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll skip around a little bit, but showing compassion, for instance, you know, asking them what's going on in their situation. Well, we're getting calls all the time, every hour of the night. Well, so tell me, how is that impacting you? I mean, that's getting down to the real reason why they're making a call. Uh, telling them that you're going to eliminate their debt. Yeah, that is, you know, that's going to happen. But what is going to get them, what's going to motivate them to actually come into your office and do something about their situation? Asking the questions about, you know, what is it that you want to change about your life? What is the most important thing for you to change? It's getting down to the true motivations for why they're calling you in the first place. Uh, it also allows you to find out information about that, that consumer that allows you to establish that connection with them. So, they, you know, they start telling you about the harassing phone calls. So, uh, do you have kids? Yeah, so how are they dealing with the phone calls? Well, I'm, I'm really afraid to even, you know, deal with the phone calls at this point. I'm afraid they're going to pick up the phone. And, 
And then it gives you the opportunity to say, yeah, I understand you. I've got kids of my own, and I understand how I might react if they were calling my house. It gives you an opportunity to establish commonality with that client right off the bat and show that you're not a whole lot different than they are. You're a human being. You're not just a lawyer. You're not just there to provide a legal service to them, but it actually allows, gives you an opportunity to show compassion for their situation and establish commonality with them. And, and, uh, you know, they, if they, let's say they start talking about the fact that they have these student loans and because they have the credit cards or the medical bills, they don't have the ability to pay their student loan debts. Yeah, you know, when I got out of law school, I had 15000 in credit cards and $30,000 worth of student loans. And I'll, I'll tell you, probably, um, it, you know, I was probably on the brink of going broke myself. What you've just done is you said to them, I'm not a whole lot different than you. And people want to hire an attorney that can relate to them, that can show them compassion, that understands the problems that they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis. And a lot of attorneys, because they're doing this over and over again every single day and having the same conversations, they get kind of jaded or their heart gets hardened to, you know, to the problems that the people are going through and they forget to take advantage of the opportunity to establish the commonality with that client and say, look, I'm not a lot different than you. I understand your pain. I can help you. I, you know, we just need to figure out what it is that you're trying to accomplish here. I don't I don't, I'm not always allowed or I don't always have a, a real commonality with my clients, so to speak, yeah. uh, luckily. <laughs> but, but at the same point, you know, you can show empathy towards the client because I'll tell you, from just seeing how lawyers operate and how they work, it's, it's clear that a lot of lawyers to some extent want to act like doctors uh, conducting a surgery or something like that. And we're dealing with people who have serious problems, whether it's bankruptcy, whether it's a federal indictment. They have problems, and people want their lawyers to be human beings. They really do. They want to be able to call up their lawyer and talk about their problems. And when you're talking to five or six people a day, and you're trying to write a brief, and you're preparing for trial, it's very difficult to do that. And I just want to give a real brief explanation of something that happened yesterday, because I had two clients, two prospective clients, that I was supposed to call back that day and, and kind of get them into my office. And I had a horrible day in court. I'm not going to get into it, but I was in a bad mood. We've all had them. We've all been in that situation where the judge is wrong, the client hates you. And I was in a bad mood all day. I did not call those clients that day. And maybe I'm going to lose them, but I'm going to call them today because I'm in a better mood. And I will tell you that when I am in a good mood, when I'm confident, when I'm feeling good, when I'm not mad at the world, I have a much better return rate or, or clients are much more happy with me and I get more business. When you're mad, that's going to go to the client. You, you can't hide that. You know, if you can fake it, that's great. You know, I can fake it in front of a jury, but you know, when you're upset, it's very difficult. So what I try to do is make sure that when I talk to a client, I'm in a decent mood, which is most of the time, and they understand that. They can relate to that, and they can pick up on that. If you call up and you're in a bad mood and you're acting like a jerk, and you think they're asking you stupid questions, they're going to call somebody else. So I think it's really important to kind of exude that uh, you know, confidence and also try to be in a good mood when you're talking to people because it really relates. So we talked about, you know, so this section is kind of about asking questions that, to identify exactly what the motivations are, but it's also about asking questions to lead the, the consumer down the path to what they need. Now remember, a lot of attorneys, you know, they get on the phone with, uh, with a client and they feel like it's not their place to tell that client to come in that they actually need to file a bankruptcy case, for instance, or need to hire a criminal lawyer. And I will tell you, you're doing your client or potential client the biggest disservice in the world by not motivating them to do something to affect a change in their situation. Uh, if you're talking to the person on the phone, they tell you that they've got $70,000 in credit card debt, $25,000 in medical bills, they have student loans they can't afford to pay. Their phone's ringing off the hook. They're about to get served with a summons. And you are not going out of your way to say to this person bluntly, look, you need to do something about this situation. This isn't, it isn't, you know, being compassionate to the person is not about sitting back and letting them get, let their situation get worse. Being compassionate is actually taking them by the reins and say, hey, wake up. You have a situation that you have to deal with. So I can sit here all day long and tell you what I'm able to do to help you, but you have to want to help yourself. So asking questions like, for instance, never ask a question that gives them the opportunity to say no. This is my favorite. 
So do you want to set an appointment with me? No. It's very easy to say. Now, you can rephrase that, and you can be, you're getting towards the end of the conversation where you're ready to go ahead and set an appointment. Well, it sounds like there's really some stuff that we can do to help you out. I just want, let's check my calendar and see when I'm available so we can set up the appointment for you. Now, you're making an assumption that they're ready to set up an appointment, but it's a lot more difficult for that consumer to say no to you if you've already made the assumption that they're coming in to see you. What you've done is you've taken through a path by asking the questions about what's motivating, you, motivating them to call you to the point where they have vocalized exactly what it is that they need. They, you should naturally have them at a point in the conversation where they're saying, I'm ready to set up an appointment. And if they don't say that, you should be assuming that they're saying it. But the, cult, the real goal is to get them to vocalize it. And it, it's human nature. When, when someone says, I want to come in for an appointment or I need to hire you, it means a lot more than the assumption that, that you make. By, by saying something, you're actually affirming mentally your need to go ahead and do that action. By just you know, assuming that they want to go ahead and set up an appointment, it's better than just asking the open-ended uh, question, do you want to come in? But you have, to, you have to ask them the question to get them to the need, and you want to ultimately get them to vocalize it, because by saying it out loud, they're a lot more likely to act on that need. And you know, when somebody calls a lawyer, whether it's a criminal defense lawyer or, or a bankruptcy lawyer, you know, they don't want to make that call. I mean, calling me up means you're in trouble. Okay, so when people call me, there is already a sense of urgency. Okay, so they know they need a criminal defense lawyer. And there's nothing wrong, whether you're a criminal lawyer or a bankruptcy lawyer, to basically talk about the sense of, sense of urgency that they have. And you're not, you're not doing it to exploit the problem. But when they call a lawyer, they're not doing it because they've got nothing better to do. They have a problem. And as the lawyer, you need to kind of explain that sense of urgency to them because one, it's true, and two, it's going to get them in your office a lot quicker. Now with me, it's not difficult to do. You know, the police are at your door. But with you guys or bankruptcy attorneys, you know, you're calling me because you have a problem. Come into my office as soon as you can. We need to talk about it. Don't do it two weeks down the road. Let's do it this week. Let's do it today. I'm available at seven, eight o'clock at night. You know, I meet people in the strangest of places, but I want to meet them right away because if they wait, then somebody's going to say, and here's a big problem, uh, you know, everybody knows somebody who knows a lawyer, okay? So if somebody calls you and you set up an appointment and they come in right away, you know, they're kind of vested with you to some extent. But if you wait a week or two, Cousin Joe's going to say, why don't you call my friend Dave? He knows a guy who knows a lawyer, and they're going to do that, and they're going to go somewhere else. So. What I like to do is get people in my office or meet with them as soon as possible uh, because it's, it's more likely that they're going to hire you. By the way, I mean, before we go on, if anyone has any questions, we really kind of want to make this interactive. So if you have suggestions of different questions that you ask in your practice to motivate people to come in or, or different ideas you have about uh, how to accomplish, you know, close the gap between the marketing and the client retention, you know, please feel free to uh, contribute. Dress. Oh, like I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> I, I won't wear Scarface t-shirts because I don't want to dress like my clients and I'm not joking about that. When I go to work on the weekends, I wear a sport coat and uh, a nice pair of pants. I am a firm believer that whether you're, if you're in court, I'm in court every day. If I go to my office and I don't have court for some weird reason, I wear a suit and tie because, you know, I see a lot of lawyers in court who don't dress like lawyers. And I'll tell you, it makes a difference. Just how you, it makes you feel better, first of all. But also, when somebody comes to hire a lawyer, it's usually someone who thinks of you in you know, one of the most respected professions. And if they come into your office and you're wearing sandals and a t-shirt, there's no, you know, that kind of, that doesn't sell, so to speak. I feel more comfortable in a suit when I'm talking to people. It's only my opinion. There are other people who I know will say I'm wrong. But personally, I think it's important to dress like a lawyer. And I, 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 I tend to agree it, sometimes. I think you have to do what feels the most comfortable for you. It also depends a lot on your, on your demographic, who exactly your clients are and understanding who they are. And that's a real important part of establishing relationships with clients is understanding who that person is. And again, by asking questions and letting them talk and not playing law professor and listening to what they have to say. You know, uh, Jerry Riskin said something that you know, I thought was really 
valuable, and he said many things that were valuable, but one thing in particular that stuck out is when, just pause, let someone talk. You know, the reason they're calling you, you know, they call you counselor for a reason. <laughs> they, you're there to listen to people's problems, and by letting people talk and not sitting there and telling them what they need and asking more and more questions, what you're doing is, number one, you're finding out information about that person which is going to allow you to establish commonality, establish a relationship, uh, create a long-term relationship. We're going to talk a little bit about establishing a lifetime value of a client uh, and really ultimately garner their loyalty and get them to actually hire you. When you're talking, you're not doing that. When you're listening to them, what you're doing is, in asking questions, you're eliciting information so you can find out more information about what is motivating them, and that is the next step to actually getting them into your office. Uh, you know, so I, we wrote down some examples of different questions you can ask uh, in talking. We're talking about getting someone to vocalize their actual need to hire you for their service. Uh, taking them down this path, is this making you lose sleep at night? Are you worrying about this? Uh, it does it, you know, um, you know, one, of, one of the questions I used to ask, have you saved money, have you saved any money for your, for your children's education? Uh, have you saved any money for retirement? Now, I know this person has $50,000 in outstanding debt. I know that they have not saved any money for their children's education. But I ask them the question anyway because I want them to say, no, I haven't saved any money for my children. No, I haven't saved any uh, money for my retirement. Because it's taking them down the path to realizing wow, this is an even bigger problem than I thought it was. There are, th there are repercussions to my situation that I haven't even considered at this point. And I'm doing that person a favor by making them realize that their situation is even more dire than it is, so that it's enabling the them to say, I need to come in. And so, you know, is this making you lose sleep at night? What's ma motivating you to contact me today? Uh, I love this one. Do you want, this is the closer. This is the, the last one before you go ahead and ask them you know, for, the, for the appointment, or they say they want the appointment. Do you want to affect a change in your life? That's a big thing for someone to say, yes, I want to make a change in my life. OK, let's go then. I've got availability tomorrow. Let's set up an appointment for you. First of all, I just want to say what you guys are sharing up here is so fantastic because this is really what we all need to know uh, to have real relationships with our clients and so many lawyers overlook it, so thank you for doing this. Um, I hear you guys talking a lot about you having the conversation with, with folks who are calling up on the phone, and I just want to put one other idea out there, which is that actually you don't need to be having this conversation with people until they get into your office. In our model, in fact, I never even see a client until I'm pretty sure they're going to come in and engage because they've spoken with someone in my office who's trained in exactly what you're talking about to ask these questions and de design to get the client to come into the office. And so I suspect that a lot of folks are actually losing people before they even come in and see you because whoever's answering your phone doesn't know how to do what Kevin is talking about here. And the best person that you can put on your phone to be sending appointments for you is someone who either has a sales background or has been given training in exactly what Kevin is talking about and can convert those phone calls into appointments for you in a really great way. So you're not having to take phone calls at 8.30 at night because we want you to get a life, right? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> right. The, the irony of the name of this conference for me is not lost. But I just, I think getting people in your office is so important. Um, it's, it's, you know, you can, you can be good on the phone, you can speak well on the phone, but when they come in your office, that's kind of your territory. You know, they can see you have a nice office, they can look at the pictures on the wall, you're face to face. I mean, no one's going to hire me unless they meet me anyway, for the most part. If you're going to hire a criminal lawyer without meeting them, you know, uh, I don't know. But to get them in the office is very important. And as far as talking on the phone, I hired an associate recently. And I give him calls to take sometimes. And I listen to him talk on the phone. And I just grab my head and you know, we talk about it for hours because he's got to learn how to do it. Sure. It's, it's an art to talk on the phone. And I never thought when I was in law school that I'd have a problem getting business. Oh, you're going to be a lawyer. There's not that many lawyers out there. They're going to just be beating down your door. Yeah, you know, but you, when you talk to him on the phone, you really got to know how to do it and get him in your office quickly. Right. And I've learned that cut to the chase, get them in, talk to them, yes. you know, tell them what you can do, but get face-to-face -face meetings. And, and, and in response to Alexis' comments, uh, it depends on your own practice, I mean, what you're most comfortable with. You know, my, my personal preference is that if you 
have the ability to get other things off your plate so you can be sitting there talking to people on the phone. There's no one who's going to be able to sell your service better than you. You are the best salesman of yourself. And you can have highly trained staff and, and for the right type of people on the phone can do that. I'm not saying that it's not, not an option because I know it's just not realistic for you to be on the phone all the time. But if the opportunity arises that you can immediately be on the phone and establish a relationship with that client, you should do that. And you should, and I will tell you, you should track the results of every single call. How many people you talk to, you set appointments for. How many people you set appointments for actually show up in your office. How many people who show up in the office actually retain? How many people that retain actually end up paying for the service, whether it's 10%, 20%, or 100%? And you should dedicate your resources internally in your office to those people that excel at that particular part of the process. So the people, and I'll, I'll be with you in one second, the people who set the best appointment, you should track what their rate of setting appointments are to people actually showing up in the office. And the people who do the best job, you should put incentives together. You should bonus them based on their performance, not as a percentage of the fees, but just basically have $500 a month for the person that during the month has the highest uh, set appointment to show up percentage or the highest set appointment to actually sign up percentage. Uh, just an incentive to align your employees' interests with your own interests. Give them a motivation to actually, um, I think we're going to have a question over here. To, to actually get people to show up to your office. This is how much have you saved for retirement? Usually nothing, very little. And I say, the credit card companies are voluntary creditors. When you retire, you're going to have involuntary creditors. People who are going to provide medical, people who are going to provide um, housing. Who do you think it's more fair to cheat out? The ones that voluntarily looked at your credit and said, yeah, I'll give this person all this money. Um, and so that, and the other thing I say is, is, you know, oh, I'm so worried about my credit. It's always be good. I'm like, no, your credit's not good. Um, in fact, bankruptcy will help improve your credit because in two years you can get a house. You'll get more credit card offers by filing bankruptcy than you, you know, do now. Well, and, and I and I agree with the, you know, the concepts that you're communicating. And my only suggestion would be to actually do that through asking them questions. Right. Let me ask you this. So you have fifty thousand dollars in outstanding debt and you can't afford the current household expenses you have exclusive of making payments on those debts, do you think that a lender is going to want to loan you money? No, they're not going to want to loan me money. Okay, well, that's the definition of credit. So now they've actually come to that conclusion themselves. You haven't taught them. In other words, you haven't professed to them that they don't have credit, but you've asked them questions so that they can come to their own conclusion that they don't have credit and that actually they should consider doing something about their situation. I do have a question. We have problems in when it's really busy, having enough people answering the phones, or after hours. Um, what are people doing to capture those people? Because if you put it over to voicemail, you basically lost them. Well, there, I mean, there are a couple things. First of all, um, you should have a separate number for current client business versus new business. So you should have an, a specific line that all of your current, your new business calls come in so you know that that is going to take the top priority. You, you know, get back to clients, you know, within an hour or two, you know, get back to them quickly, be diligent about it. But you can't be, you're paying for your marketing, you can't be letting that food, so to speak, fall off the table. I mean, you're paying for your marketing, you have to realize every single return on your marketing investment that you possibly can. If you're not picking up the phone, you got a problem. Now, they're answering services, virtual receptionists that you can I use. I use a service and they know to ask, you know, if I, if I leave the office, whenever I leave it, I'll put on my service and they'll, they'll ask if it's a new client. If it's a new client, they'll call me and they'll patch me through because, you know, the, the quicker you can speak to them, the less that's also a nice call someone else. It's also a nice thing about having a dedicated number for new business yeah. because you can always have that ring to forward it to a cell phone if you, if you care to do that. Or you can also take rotations in your office. I mean, I bet you, you if you ask, look, if you, uh, it's a voluntary thing, would anybody be willing to take one night a week till 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, so three hours after you know, the close of regular business hours, you take the cell phone home with you, and you answer any calls, and for each appointment that you set, I'll pay you $10 in overtime. 
and, and phone doesn't ring, and you have to worry about it. But then you get one night a week for each of your staff members or a couple members, and it's not a big deal. And again, these are all personal preferences. It just depends, you know, what your uh, tolerance is for kind of letting that opportunity fall off the table. But it, they are things to consider, and these are solutions that you can use. Um, I, just w I want to make one comment because I think it's, it's kind of important, and it's a problem I've had. Uh, you know, what Kevin's talking about, what I'm talking about, what this conference is about, you know, you're trying to get business, you're trying to get clients, and that can be a full-time job when you're out on your own, when you have your own practice. And if you're like me, you know, I'm picking a jury in federal court in a week and a half. I got appeals due with the Seventh Circuit. I've got murder trials starting at the end of the summer. So you also have to strike a balance between getting business and properly doing the job for the clients that you have, and it's not always easy. And I know that's something everybody keeps their own internal clock, but when, when you're getting business, you gotta strike that balance as well as you can between always trying to get more business and doing what you need to do. And, and uh, recently, I've had to kind of step back and say, you know what, I'm not even going into the office today. I'm taking my file, I'm going to a library and I'm gonna put my service on because when I'm at the office, I could have the best intentions. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this brief, I'm gonna prepare for trial, and then the phone rings and it's a new client. And then I'm talking with that client for an hour and a half and then somebody else calls me. So I think it's important to realize that we are lawyers, you know, and we are also trying to get clients, but you know, I've seen people get in trouble when all they wanna do is get the business and they don't realize that there's a lot of other things that go with it. And I'm not giving a cautionary tale to anybody, I'm just speaking from personal experience that it's something that recently I've taken some new routes to try to you know, get rid of any problems in that, in, that, in that field and basically go to a library and turn off the phone. And there, and, you know, there are any number of the experts that have uh, spoken through the course of the first day uh, that you can feel free to call and talk to about, about these issues. I'm sure a lot of them would be willing to give you a few minutes of their time absolutely free and make suggestions feel free to call me as well. I'm happy to talk to you for free. I mean, I do it all the time. Uh, but I'm happy to just give you my thoughts about, as related to your particular situation, if you are struggling with how to achieve that balance, uh, draw the right line, I'm happy to talk to you about it. So I got Scott Segaria sitting over here, who's an attorney out in, in California. And uh, they've gone through a lot of changes in their practice over the last couple of months. And so he's sending a lot more appointments. And I was just curious to, hear from you, uh, you know, how you approach the issue of an attorney versus a staff person setting the appointments, how you're going about training them, and what is the process as, as far as setting an appointment, how you're tracking who send the appointments, etc. Well, what we did for training was, honestly, we called you. And you did a conference with our whole staff, and we taught people how to do the phone screens. And so we have attorneys pick up the phone, we have eight attorneys. So the attorneys Get the, get the call, and they always talk to an attorney. And what we do is when the, the calls come in, we take their information down immediately. The assistant takes the information down immediately. And then we uh, transfer to an attorney. They talk to them for probably 10 minutes. We don't like it to go too long, because some people will be on the phone for two hours but get too long. So we try to limit just getting the information try to give them some information, like especially about what it takes to, to, to retain our office, how easy we'll get an appointment, and get them where they want to come in for an appointment. But the hard part is, I mean, we, we work in the Bay Area, we have seven different offices, so we're dealing with a really large scale. You know, we do probably 50 or 100 phone screens a week. And it, you know that the organization behind that is, is challenging, once you're good at it. I mean, after talking to Kevin, just to give you guys information, how, how good this information is. Is anyone here from California? Because I don't want anyone to take my business. <laughs> Northern California. <laughs> but I will tell you unequivocally, after one conversation with him, our business increased probably 300%. It's, a, and it's mostly related to establishing the relationship with the client. You only have a few minutes on the phone with that client to convey to them that you care about their situation, that you're not that much different, you understand what is going on, and, and, and motivate them to actually get into your office. 
you can't squander that opportunity by talking about legal concepts or the automatic stay or the discharge injunction or any of those things. You have a small window of time to establish the relationship and you have to take advantage of that by asking them questions and getting them to vocalize exactly what, what it is that they need. And one mistake we made, we used to do, is I used to do most of the consultation myself and we used to just set appointments. So I think a lady over there says, how do I get my staff to know the person to set the appointments? The problem is you waste a lot of your time. You need to know that these people are qualified. You need to know that the range of price that you give them is not going to scare them. Where if they say, okay, well, it's 100 bucks to retain, like, why well, don't I don't have $100? Okay, well, that pretty much knows they're, they're not going to hire you. So what we try to do is get, you know, one thing Kevin always talks about is eliminating barriers. Eliminating barriers that are going to get them from coming to your office. Eliminating barriers that get them to retain us. But some of them, there is no barrier. They just want to milk you for information. They just want to, you know, and that's not a barrier. That's just a waste of time. So what the phone screens do, and I advise everyone to have the attorneys do the phone screens. I mean, this is very much pertaining to bankruptcy. Like, so if you have attorneys, because they say, well, I'm an attorney. You know, and what they do, how they set the appointments with us is they say, well, you know, you're a really important case. You're going to meet with our senior person. You're going to meet with the owner of our firm. And so if you do it that way, it kind of sets up, you know, where they're, they feel important. You know, so, and that's, it's, it's, the hardest thing I think for us to do was to get the system down. But once you get it down, I mean, we're still fine tuning it. My, my office manager just leaned over and said, why don't we have Kevin talk to them again now that we got this thing going? You know, so the hardest thing is getting it down. But once it gets down, it becomes more like a system. Yeah. I think there's another question back there. And, it, and I'll touch on, uh, we're kind of skipping around a whole bunch, but if no one objects, we'll just do it. Uh, it would be uh, overruled anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Objection. <laughs> objection. Overruled. Uh, so like eliminate, eliminating, eliminating obstacles is, is very important. A, a lot of attorneys, what they do when they're talking about their fees, quoting fees, telling uh, consumers uh, what they charge. This is my favorite. Uh, I talk to attorneys who are doing marketing, and they say, you know, I can't get any of these people to show up. So I start asking them, well, tell me what you talk to the clients about on the phone. Well, they call me up and I tell them to come in with uh, $750 and we'll go ahead and do their case. Okay. I never well, talk about money on the phone. Yeah, ever. I mean, and, and everybody goes about it a different way, but what you're doing is two things there. Number one, you're probably disqualifying yourself immediately because the person doesn't have $750 to get started. And what you're doing is you're creating a natural obstacle. You are creating an obstacle in the way of that person making the decision to set an appointment and come in your office. You know what the hardest dollar uh, there is to get is the first dollar. If you can get that client to put down even $20 or $100, you've taken the hardest step. You've gotten that client to sign the retainer agreement. Now you can, now you got to give you 100 bucks. Now the next hardest dollar is the next $100. But once you've gotten $200 from them, the chances of them paying in full are exponentially greater. But the point is get them in the door, get them to retain, and then worry about how you can follow up with them to get paid the rest of your fees. Whether it's a payment processing solution or regular calls, guess what? You know what a collection call is? It's an opportunity for you to show compassion to your client and show them you care. Hey, you know, I noticed that you haven't made a payment in about six weeks to us. We just want to make sure everything's okay. Everything going okay? You know, are the creditors bothering you? It gives you an opportunity for, to get them to revocalize their need to get the, the entire process taken care of. And just one thing I just want to touch on real quick is that um, it, the initial consultation is important and when they retain you it's important but also what is important is to let this person know that you're their lawyer and what I mean by that is this when I have a client you know with my type of work you know people I, I'm their lawyer I'm their psychiatrist I'm their priest I talk to them all the time they confide in me but I'm their lawyer and you know what when a family member gets arrested or when a family member gets into a car accident or gets hurt they call me now I don't do personal injury cases but I have friends who do and I refer those cases to other people and I think that there's nothing wrong with that but to, when when somebody trusts you and somebody likes you even though they know you only do one type of law area of the law they'll call you when anything happens right. and then you can refer the case to someone else and well you know, unlike, unlike Damon who you know gets a lot of repeat business uh, <laughs> Most people are calling a bankruptcy lawyer really Because I win all my cases and they just keep getting arrested. I'm right. <laughs> uh, but most people are calling a bankruptcy lawyer are calling a lawyer for the first time in their lives. 
and that is your opportunity to make, make a lifetime client yeah. who's going to come back to you with every single legal problem they ever have for the rest of your life. So, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, a little bit more, if we have time, establishing that lifetime value. Um, you know, set up relationships with other uh, lawyers who handle estate planning and divorce and workers' comp and personal injury and cross-market your services and say, look, I'm your, you know, Alexis talks about I, a family lawyer. I am your family lawyer. I am your lifetime lawyer. Anything you need, you come to me. That's what you want. You want them coming to you. You want them referring people to you. So it's, it's vital to establish the relationship, not only to motivate them to take the first step to do about the instant situation, but also to get them to come back to you for their future and everything that might happen in their life. Aaron, did you have, did you have a question? I want to add one little yeah. thought or two. Uh, since I've been doing this about uh, 25,000 times when the 2005 came along and the world ended, uh, one of the, uh, my marketing director I hired him to come in and, and kind of fix what was going to be broke, and he gave me two or three bits of advice. One was I needed better magazines in the lobby and a plasma screen. <laughs> and uh, the second one, which is more significant, is, is listen, you can't keep screening these client calls yourself. It's just not going to work anymore. You've got to stop. And I go, well, Jeff, I've done this for 25 years. I can't change the spots on the leverage. It's, we have a triage system now. They go to see the paralegal for 45 minutes, and they see you for 15. You just don't have time. So I tried to listen to him because I pay him a lot, and I should listen to him. But after a couple of weeks, I realized that what people came to see me for, and they sit down there every day, and they say, you know why I came to see Mr. Epstein? Because you talked to me on the phone. I called three other lawyers, didn't get to talk to anybody. I talked to you, and that's why I'm here. So I was stuck in that situation, and I still am, which is kind of the, uh, my Achilles heels, but it works, and it keeps working. And, and, and again, I mean, it all, it all depends on what, what works for, for your own practice, and it's a challenge that we all have to face. I mean, sometimes there's a hybrid. Maybe what you do is you have a, uh, a really good uh, paralegal support staff talk to the client initially, kind of get the relationship primed up, and then say, you know what, uh, I'm going to go, go ahead and get Mr. Epstein and, you know, off the phone. Hold on one second. And then actually what you've done is you've established that you took time out of your schedule. You're on another call or you're in the middle of something else and you broke out and you say, and you've taken a couple minutes of your time to actually personally get on the phone with that client. And what that does is that puts that client over the edge. It, one of the things that you know, we talk about a little bit in the workbook, and for some of the stuff we don't uh, get to, a lot of the concepts are here, uh, is establishing uh, the human need for reciprocation. You know, people, human nature is that people want to reciprocate when you do something for them. So, you know, for instance, the example I just talked about by Aaron, for instance, taking a moment, taking a few minutes out of his day, interrupting in order to get on the phone with that person. Now what you've done is you have created a need in them to reciprocate the favor that he did by actually showing up for their appointment. Same thing when you set an appointment. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about, you, you, know, you don't want to just set an appointment. You want to get them to make a commitment to you. The way that you get them to make that, you know, it's easy to break an appointment. It's, it's against human nature to break a commitment. You don't want to break commitments. How many people here like breaking commitments? Not many. How many people have blown off appointments? A lot. So when, by going out of your way, by saying, looking at your schedule when you're trying to schedule the appointment, you know, I'm really slammed on Wednesday, but, um, you know, is there any time on Wednesday that you have available? Client says, oh, around 3 o'clock. Okay, well, I've got some other stuff at 3, but you know what? I'm going to adjust my schedule. I'm going to open 3 up, but you've got to promise me that you're going to commit to making it 3 o'clock because I'm adjusting my schedule. Now you've gotten that person not just to make an appointment with you at 3 o'clock. They've made a commitment to show up at that time because you've gone out of their way and adjusted your schedule for them. So it, it's more you have to get out of the idea that you're just going through this motion of trying to get a time and date scheduled. You're trying to get a commitment scheduled from the client. I, don't know if you can... I couldn't agree more. Oftentimes, you know, I used to blow off appointments until people started blowing off my appointments, and then I realized, <laughs> you know, I'd blow off a dentist appointment, not call them. And now when people, and now I know the importance of being there because people set time aside. But Kevin's right, especially in this in this type of market, uh, it's important. 
to have people, to, to, to let them know that you're doing something special for them and your time is important. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. I just want to share this advice because uh, this is a three foot five thing. Since there's nobody here from my uh, locality <laughs> that I recognize, you're not still on technical. The one thing I do before I leave the office at night, I go through the appointments to say there's 10 or 12 and I had three that didn't show up. I personally call these folks on whatever best number, best contact number. And I, and I just speak to them or leave a message on voice and say, listen, I'm sure something came up and you couldn't make the appointment. Please feel free to call us on our new client hotline 24-7. Be glad to reschedule the appointment. Making them feel like even if they just forgot or decided not to come, give them another chance. And my recidivism rate, my recovery rate, it runs about 60%. They will call back, I'm sorry, something came up. My right. Got awesome. that's, that's great. And, and uh, I'll also tell you that some of those extra <coughs> things you do, the one or two calls that you make, you'll have some of the most meaningful experiences as far as your quality of life and your enjoyment of what you're doing at work on those calls. Because the, the sound of appreciation and the voice of the person who, who picks up Thank you so much for following. Thank you for caring. Thanks for taking an interest in my situation. That's what makes you really enjoy what you do every day. Isn't that the reason that many of us became lawyers in the first place? Is because we really like helping people and talking to people about their problems. It's not about filling out paperwork or ordering a credit report or you know, doing the tedious things from day to day. It's about establishing a relationship with that client that works to your advantage from a business perspective, but it also makes you feel really good about what you're doing. And, and not only people who set up appointments and, and don't show up, but if I'm driving uh, home from work and I'm stuck in traffic, or if I'm going to a, a distant courthouse and I've got time to kill, you know, I'll turn off the radio and I'll call an existing client up. Somebody who I don't have a scheduled appointment with, somebody who is out on bond, somebody who you know, is, is facing a serious criminal charge, and I'll talk to him for five or 10 minutes to let him know I'm working on his case, to see how he's doing. And when you do that, you know, when you just kill some time by calling a client that has already retained you, you know, you can hear it in their voice that they're first of all shocked that you're calling them just to see how they're doing. You know, usually they say, do I owe you any money? But no, I just called to see how you're doing, talk about your case a little bit. And that, I think, you, you can't stress that enough that when a lawyer calls someone out of the blue, a client of theirs, and talks to them, they're shocked and they're extremely happy. And what that means is they're gonna remember you. Later, they're going to remember you, and they're going to tell people about you that, yeah, my lawyer called me out of the blue and talked to me. And I think that uh, that's, that's very important to do to clients. And plus, how much talk radio can you listen to? I mean, you know, how much Springsteen can you listen to? I'm sorry. David, what do they do owe you money? Well, that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole, other, uh, that's a whole other conference. <clears throat> you know, I, I have, and I'm a, maybe in a little different situation. I don't do billable hours. I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, so I'm on the federal defender panel for the Northern District of Illinois, so sometimes I have to bill cases, but for the most part, I do flat fees, and when you're in my profession, you get paid a good retainer usually, and then you know people do sometimes owe you down the road, but my, my, uh, my perspective on that is be upfront with your clients about it. You know, a lot of people, uh, especially if your practice isn't doing that great, You'll take any case you can get, I guess, and you know, you'll let people string you along. But with me, I'm very upfront about it. And you have to be able to talk about money in this profession. Because when you do have a relationship with clients, they sometimes think that you're, you know, their friend is as opposed to their lawyer. And with me, you know, they've got to pay me. And I say, look, when you go to work and your boss doesn't pay you, what do you do? You don't go to work anymore. And that's a difficult conversation to have. But all lawyers who work for themselves have those conversations. <laughs> I think you've got to be you know, stern with them, but still respectful of their situation. Uh, and if it gets to the point where they're just a dead pay, you've got to be willing to say, I've got to terminate the attorney-client relationship. It's the hardest part of the job, is having people pay you money. You know, when you're a personal injury lawyer, you work on a contingent fee. So if you do the job, you win the case, you get the money. You know, we're asking people to go into their savings accounts, to go into their bank accounts, to reach into their pockets and hand over money. And uh, a lot of people will hand over a little bit of money, but then down the road, they don't want to hand over any more money. That's why you got to be upfront initially with them to tell them what it's going to cost and maybe set up a payment schedule. W one of the things I do, not with all my clients, but I'll have a retainer agreement. And the retainer agreement will say, this is the, uh, this is the retainer fee, and you have to pay this through the period of the case. 
you know, with the schedule. And if they don't pay that, there have been times where I've had to withdraw on cases. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, Allison Shields is going to be talking about fees and financing for Gallaty. I'm sure this is one of the subjects that she'll touch on is how to deal with uh, fee issues, financing, law firm operations, et cetera. So, yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I do general practice. I do a lot of uh, domestic relations, and personal injury. Most of my stuff is, is built out. And I find out that when, when you lose a client because they don't pay you, you lose three times. Number one, you don't get the money that, that you're owed. Number two, they're not going to come back to you. And number three, they're not going to refer anybody to you at any time. And that's a really good point. And sometimes you do have to take a loss on cases. You know, if somebody, if I charge somebody, you know, just make up a number, $15,000 for a case, and they can only pay me $12,000, I'm not going to withdraw on the case, you know, because that's just part of the practice. But there are times where you know that you're getting beat by someone and they're doing it, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, intentionally. You've got to be able to <coughs> draw a distinction between that. And you're right, because if you cut somebody a break, Let's say somebody owes you an extra $500. You know, are you going to withdraw on the case? No, you're going to tell them, look, we, made, we had an agreement. I'm going to honor my end of it, but you know, don't forget that I did this. And then do the case. And you're right, that will lead to other business. Right. And what I've done, and this is you know, shocking to maybe some people, I'll tell somebody what it's going to cost. And there will be times where I won't have to do as much work on the case as I initially thought. And somebody will owe me the remainder of a fee. And I'll say, you know what? You paid me a good retainer. This wasn't as complicated as I thought it was going to be. I got you a good plea agreement. We're not going to have to go to trial. Keep, keep whatever I said you owed me. And I when you do that to somebody, first of all, you're being honest to them because you're not gouging them. You know, you're not earning that fee, so it's, it's right to let them keep it. But at the same point, think of how they're going to feel and think of the good press you've just given yourself. Well, I think that's a, that's a, that? that's a, and I think that's a general, and again, talking about establishing a good relationship on, a, on an ongoing basis. Uh, Always under promise and over deliver. It always makes you look like a rock star. When you set your client's expectations low and you deliver high, you're always going to look great. If you're not going to be able to deliver a bankruptcy case or the result with, let's say, in a week, uh, let's say I figure I can get the case done in a week, I'll tell them it's 10 days. Because then when I get it done in five days, I look like I've been extremely attentive and responsive to their needs. But if I tell them I'm going to get it done in five days and it takes 10 days, then I'm a crummy attorney who's not worthy of getting paid and not worthy of getting referrals. Lawyers are the worst at setting themselves up to fail by over-adjusting their clients' expectations as far as what they can deliver. You're, you're better off saying you can deliver less without completely underselling yourself. You're better off saying you can, you know, you can deliver less and deliver a great result that the client's going to be happy for and want, going to want to come back to you and going to want to refer other clients to. I told the guy he was going to get 30 years and he only got 20 and he wasn't happy. So I don't know if, it's, I don't know if it really, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. So but, I wanted, to, before we run, because we're kind of running out of time here, we've got, you know, under 10 minutes. <laughs> the uh, cards, Alan would yeah. say less than that, but. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about aggressive follow-up. And I want to tell you at, uh, and just to give you a, a little perspective on, on some of the things we did, and you know, we grew a law firm from two attorneys uh, in a 1,200 square foot uh, office about a, a mile from here to 80 lawyers across 19 states. We had offices in, in 65 cities. We were advertising on over you know, 200 television stations across the country, dozens and dozens of print publications, uh, internet uh, uh, advertising. Uh, we opened up practices locally in divorce and DUI, uh, started a national consumer class action practice, a national personal injury and workers' comp practice. So I've dealt with clients in a lot of these different uh, areas. And if there's any one thing that you learn, it's about aggressive follow-up, that people generally, you need to help them help themselves. Uh, first, again, it's getting to them to acknowledge and to vocalize that they need your help. But then it's helping them. You can't just expect them to show up to their appointment by, the, by themselves. You got to help them. So just to give you an idea, we would set an appointment for a, a potential bankruptcy client. Okay, we would call that client two days before their appointment to confirm. If we got a voicemail or a recorder, we would leave a message. First of all, we'd send a nice four-color 
map with a brochure and a nice cover letter confirming their appointment, nice four, you know, four-color map to the office, a welcome letter. There was even a little thing in there, hey, if you know anyone who's been injured in an accident, we also handle personal injury, so we're immediately starting to cross market. We'd send them that letter. We'd call them two days before an appointment. We'd leave a message at any number that they provided to us that they said we could leave a message at. If we didn't talk to them, even if we left a message with a human being, we'd call the day before the appointment at all the available telephone numbers trying to reach them again. Uh, we would call on the morning of the appointment if we still hadn't reached them saying, hey, we've got an appointment later today. Within 20 minutes of them not showing up for their appointment, we'd be on the phone, trying to get them on the phone. If they answer, they say, oh, uh, you know, I overslept. Okay, what are you doing right now? We're open until 2 o'clock this afternoon. We would call, uh, you know, let's say it was a Saturday appointment, we'd call on the following Monday to say, hey, you missed your appointment, we're calling to try and reschedule. We'd call again two days later to try and reschedule. At that point, we would send what we called a missed appointment letter to them saying, hey, you didn't make your appointment, we just want to let you know we are available for you. Uh, we, you know, we assume that your situation hasn't changed. Uh, so if at any time you need the help of, you know, need our help, we're happy to help you out. I mean, talk about aggressive follow-ups. We the uh, next step is kidnapping them, bringing yes. them to the office. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, but it, if you think about what the cost is associated with going through the, through that entire process, let's say for each client that you do that, that costs you an extra five dollars. If your average fee on a bankruptcy case, for instance, is fifteen hundred dollars, if one out of every three hundred potential clients that you do that with ends up retaining you as a result of the efforts, you've just made your investment back. And you don't need a senior level associate, you know, a paralegal or a senior uh, employee doing those things. In fact, you should have a you know, law student, an intern, someone, a receptionist, someone doing all of those follow-up calls. But if you're not willing to engage in aggressive follow-up, you're not going to land the business. Uh, and, but if you do this, I guarantee you, you, the number of people that, you show, that end up showing up for their appointments and retaining your services is going to in, increase dramatically. I don't know if you have anything to oh, add. I, I, I don't know if I saw the yellow card, but uh, <laughs> I, I adopt everything that Kevin just said, <laughs> and I agree <laughs> for purposes of the record. Uh, so we're kind of out of time, but does any, anyone have any further questions or follow anything I didn't touch on that people would like to know a little bit more about? Again, I'm happy to talk to anybody, anytime. Uh, you know where to find me. So thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks.